And I'm going to turn the meeting over to our LGS member, Lynn Grossman, who will now introduce our speaker. So Lynn, nice to have you here today, and I'm gonna let you do the rest of the talking. Thank you, Nancy, and welcome to everyone who is Zooming in. Isn't this a fun way to see everybody and just think how much money and time we're saving by not driving to and from meetings. <laughs> Today, our subject for the program is George Dennison Prentice. Prentice was the founder and editor, editor of the Louisville Journal in the mid-1800s. He is a very controversial figure, and even to this day, recently, December 11th, 2018, his name appeared in the Courier Journal as his statue was removed and put into storage. Today, we're going to learn from James Pritchard all about Prentice and we get to make our own decision about how we think he should be remembered. Jim is a manuscript cataloger at the Filson Historic Society. He has a BA and an MA from Wright State University, and he's the author of Embattled Capital, Frankfort, Kentucky in the Civil War, an interesting subject of its own. The day, today he's going to focus all of his energies on George Dennison Prentice. Mr. Pritchard, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, uh, I've been a public speaker since 1986. And I told my supervisor before I gave this talk last, last year at the Filson that this is the most difficult talk that I've ever given, largely because of the times we're living in now, when uh, immigration, the debate over immigration is in the forefront again. And of course, we now have uh, major urban riots in our cities. And at the same time, as uh, you pointed so, uh, out so well, George D. Prentice is one of the most controversial and in many cases hated figures in Louisville history. As a matter of fact, when his statue was removed uh, from behind the public library, uh, Joe Girth wrote in the Courier Journal that he hoped that it would be blown up with dynamite. So I entered on my research on George D. Prince and Bloody Monday with a, with a little bit of trepidation. But what I found was uh, a different perspective on both Prentice and Bloody Monday. Now, anti-Catholicism, uh, nativism has been part of the national fabric uh, since the Alien and Sedition Acts of the 1790s. I can remember uh, as a boy being raised uh, as in a Methodist family, uh, older people being concerned that, uh, you know, John F. And he told his son to, you know, mind his mother, uh, attend to his studies, be a good American, and to be a good Catholic. And that young officer uh, is now, with a lot of his shipmates, covered by the great shroud of the sea. He was aboard the Wasp when she was torpedoed by the Japanese, and he went down with that ship. Well, to use modern language, you know, that letter went viral. But yet, just a matter of a few years later, another Catholic naval officer who was awarded the Purple Heart is questioned because of his religion, in spite of the courage and sacrifice that he and other Roman Catholics made to the war effort. And the same thing with World War I. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, reemerged on the eve of the First World War. And it was not only a uh, white supremacist organization, but it was also anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish, 
Uh, Al Smith was a Roman Catholic Democrat that was running for the presidency. And of course, this threat of uh, a Catholic takeover of America was part of the Klan platform at that time. And the same thing with the Civil War. Roman Catholics fought on both sides. Uh, a lot of Roman Catholics, like uh, the famous Irish Brigade of New York, helped preserve the Union. But in the 1890s, uh, the American Defense uh, Associations, I think it was called, emerged as an anti-Catholic organization. But let's try to understand what people in the 1850s might have felt. And one thing we have to keep in mind, and for those of you who didn't uh, hear this part early on, I've got a portrait of Mr. Prentice uh, hanging right, right behind me on this presentation. For people in, from the founding to the even the Civil War, the United States of America was a Protestant nation it was part of a family of Protestant nations. And of course, nations like Spain, France, Italy, Austria, were considered part of the family of Roman Catholic nations. Religious uh, animosity and intolerance dates all the way back to the Reformation. The uh, brutal wars of religion in the 17th century uh, were followed by what you might consider sort of a long-standing Cold War between Roman Catholic nations and Protestant nations. The English Civil War was a war over religion in many ways. Uh, many Puritans, the Roundheads, Oliver Cromwell, all that, felt that uh, the king was too soft where Roman Catholics were concerned and that his wife, being a Roman Catholic, uh, had undue influence on the court. So this is part of the reason for the uh, outbreak of the English Civil War, which caused widespread death and destruction from 1642 to about 1650, as I recall. And uh, this war was so destructive, this is one of the reasons why the Founding Fathers uh, established religious freedom and tolerance and tried to Put a barrier between church and state. So this is something to keep in mind. Guy Fawkes Day, of course, is still celebrated uh, in England, although in a far more watered down fashion. But it was initially a holiday that capped a series of Protestant England's victories over the threat posed by Catholic superpowers like France and Spain. And Guy Fawkes is may be aware, uh, was a Catholic who, uh, with his conspirators, placed a considerable amount of explosives in the uh, basement in Parliament and planned to assassinate not only the king, but to kill every member of Parliament. And the plot was discovered and, uh, you know, the perpetrators were all, uh, you know, put to death. But it was celebrated ever afterwards. And usually in these celebrations, there were bonfires. And there would be effigies of Guy Fawkes and effigies of the Pope, and then effigies of the devil. And so the crowds would go through the street waving these effigies. Uh, women and children would be leaning out of upstairs windows, shaking their fist at the Pope and the devil and Guy Fawkes. And then at the end of the procession, uh, all these effigies would be thrown into the bonfire. Well, this was carried over to the colonies and it was celebrated as Pope Day. Uh, sometimes, I think, as late in New England as after the Civil War, these celebrations went on. And uh, again, no popery was the battle cry from the English Civil War all the way through the uh, colonial era. So we have this religious divide that's already hardwired into the national fabric. When something remarkable occurs, a tsunami of immigrants strikes the United States in the 1840s and crests uh, in the 1850s. And the vast majority of these immigrants were Roman Catholic from Ireland and 
Germany, there were also a wave of German Protestant immigrants. But even, you know, uh, the Henry Ward Beechers and the evangelists of those days had problems with German Protestants because they, uh, they drank beer on Sunday. You can imagine something like that on Sabbath. So there were problems even with, with uh, German Protestants at that time. So this was the atmosphere that led rise to the Native American or Know Nothing Party. This party, in many ways, was founded on the wrecks of Henry Clay's Whig Party. Clay died in 1852, and his party went to pieces shortly afterwards over the slavery issue. And so many former Whigs were, including George D. Prentice, were looking around to build a new party movement. Now, Prentice, when he founded the Louisville Daily Journal in 1833, had come from Connecticut to Kentucky in 1830 to write the first campaign biography of Henry Clay. And Clay was so impressed that they established a major Whig party organ in Louisville, the Daily Journal. And in his time, Prentice was one of the most noted journalists in the entire United States. Uh, he was the rival of all the, and the peer of all the major New York journalists uh, of his era. And the Louisville Daily Journal had a wide, strong circulation in the Midwest, uh, the West, and the South in particular. And in that era, there's a, so much controversy today over you know, CNN and MSNBC versus Fox. You know, the news is slanted toward a particular political outlook. Well, in Prentice's lifetime and well into the 20th century, that was considered fitting and proper. He was a Whig paper. He promoted the interests of the Whig party and the candidates of the Whig party. That was his uh, role in the partisan politics of his era. And of course, he dueled sometimes literally and figuratively with either the pen or pistol with some of his democratic rivals. Of course, Prentice um, was a man of many faults. Uh, evidently, he uh, was a very heavy drinker and uh, was, his marriage was not a very happy one as I understand it. So fortunately, when he would get into these pistol scrapes, he, he never hit anything. So that was probably fortunate for him that uh, he liked to tip a little bit. Prentice seized on the Native American party, the Know Nothings. You to join, you had to take an oath. And if anybody, once you were accepted a membership, if anybody asked you, you know, what's this new party all about? Well, your response was to be, I know nothing. I know nothing about this party. He decided that the nativist issues were important enough to be a distraction over the slavery issue, which had brought about the destruction of the Whig parties. He felt that he could build a party with both Southerners and Northerners behind this nativist banner. And in this way, his primary goal for joining the Know Nothing Party, he did it very late. Now the uh, Bloody Monday riots took place in early August of 1855. He didn't join the Know Nothing Party until the spring of that year. So he joined very late. But his primary reason was that he felt that the Republican Party, which was on the rise at that time, and the Democratic Party were leading the nation toward civil war. So that was his primary reason for joining. And sister uh, Edith McGann, whose 1940 study of nativism in Kentucky, was surprised that so many prominent Americans were part of this party. And you don't see this with the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, and you don't see this with the American Protectives Association of the 1890s. Uh, those were mostly, uh, many of their leaders were, in those days, were regarded as bigoted cranks. But for the Nothing Party, you had the support of Senator John J. Crittenden, 
uh, Governor Charles Moorhead of Kentucky, whose wife was Catholic. Go figure that. Uh, Millard Fillmore, the uh, former president of the United States, who would run in 1856 on the Know Nothing ticket, and on and on and on. John Marshall Harlan, the future Chief Justice, was a Know Nothing in Kentucky. Why were they so concerned about these thousands upon thousands of Catholic immigrants coming into the country? What's usually left out of the picture is what was going on in Europe at that time. Now, Tom Paine wrote many years before that he hoped that the American experiment, the American Revolution, would be a beacon of hope for all the people who were still under the heels of the crowns heads of Europe. And of course, the American Revolution did help spark the French Revolution. The American Revolution also sparked the nationalist and democratic revolutions that took place in Europe in 1848. Again, a lot of German immigrants uh, were forced to flee, or citizens, excuse me, were forced to flee to the United States in the 1840s and 1850s because the crowned heads of Europe, Austria, France and Italy were able to overcome these revolutions. Some of you I know have heard of the Giuseppe Garibaldi, the great Italian liberator and patriot, and also uh, Louis Kasuk, who is uh, Garibaldi's equivalent in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They both tried to establish the independence of Italy and Hungary separately, and both were defeated by the Catholic armies of Austria and France and Italy with the blessing and the backing of Pope Pius IX. Let me give you one example of uh, how these revolutions in the late 1840s, coinciding with all this immigration, impacted Americans. Some of the leading anti-Catholic uh, spokesperson in the 1850s were abolitionists. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, before she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, wrote anti-Catholic tracts. Uh, Margaret Fuller, the uh, feminist and transcendentalist, was in Rome when uh, Garibaldi's revolution first erupted in 1848. And she witnessed the establishment of the Republic short-lived Republic of Rome. What happened during the short-lived Republic? The Pope was forced into exile. The Jews were freed from the ghetto. Freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, freedom of religion was established and they became a democracy. Well, a few months later, the French army destroyed the Republic placed uh, Pius IX back in the Vatican, and all of these changes were done away with. They reverted back to the way uh, the papal states had existed, uh, you know, since, uh, for centuries, actually. And Margaret Fuller was horrified. You know, she wrote, she was also a newspaper correspondent, and she wrote letters back to the United States about, you know, how the uh, pontiff and the Jesuits uh, in alliance with the crown heads of Europe, were crushing out democratic movements and nationalist movements in, in uh, Europe at that time. And so here you have a nation, the United States, that's founded on Enlightenment values, but the head of the church, Pius IX, is a, bit, a leader of the anti-Enlightenment in Europe at that time, and is a bitter foe of some of the uh, tenets uh, of the Enlightenment. He was not a fan uh, of the United States of America, as a matter of fact. But we have to be fair. You know, as a young man, he witnessed the horrors, the death and destruction of the French Revolution, uh, a revolution that uh, he 
had some good measures regarded as atheistic and a threat to the very foundations of the church. So it is understandable why he would view these revolutions in 1848 as on the dangerous, same dangerous path that the French Revolution followed. So these are some of the reasons that, uh, or some of the factors that were taking place in Europe. And again, not only was the American population skyrocketing with all the new immigrants, but Louisville's population was skyrocketing. Um, check my notes here. I want to stray too far from the script. Yeah, in 1850, the population of the city was 36,224, and over 11,000 of those individuals were recently arrived uh, German and Irish Catholics. So this created a lot of tension in the community, again, despite the fact that many Germans and Irish fought for the United States in the Mexican War. But the argument was, and to be quite frank, this is what Jesuits taught. Who do these Catholics owe their recently arrived immigrants owe their allegiance to? This government, our president, or to the pontiff, the pope? And again, there were events that took place during the Mexican War that fed these fears. Some of you might have heard of the, the famous colorful San Patricio Battalion, or St. Patrick's Battalion, which was composed of American deserters, Irish Catholics, to the Mexican army, because the Mexican government was sending propaganda through the lines. Why are you good Catholics fighting against we good Catholics for a Protestant nation? So the Mexican government was able to actually recruit a battalion of Irish Catholic deserters to fight against the United States Army during the Mexican War. And of course, the small minority of individuals who deserted, you know, became overblown and obscured the courage and sacrifices of the Germans and Irish who did not desert the American Army and contributed to the victory. So again, these tensions were all building at this particular time. Prentice, when he decided to become a know-nothing, immediately became involved in a war of words with Benedict Webb, uh, a devout Catholic journalist. He would write a history of uh, Catholicity in Kentucky in the 1880s, 1890s, I believe. He used to work for the journal. He used to work for Prentice. He liked him personally. So their war of words was just simply that. It was political disagreement. At the same time, Bishop Martin J. Spalding was engaged in a war of words with Samuel F. Morse, uh, not only the inventor of the telegraph, but a very prominent nativist at that time. And then Louisville's Reverend Samuel Howard Ford was also engaged in a war of words with Bishop Spalding and was publishing uh, tracts, Protestant tracts about uh, Catholicism's threat to freedom. Prentice's editorials were very similar to the journalism of his time. Now remember, voting was a male uh, undertaking, primarily. You know, women would cheer, women would be at rallies, women would hear the speeches, but they didn't have the right to participate, didn't have the right to hold office. And so, Politics in that era, and we'll get into this a little bit more shortly, was almost like a male contact sport. So you always use military terms. You know, election day was the day of battle. So this would be the type of language that not only uh, Prentice would use, but the Democratic uh, opponents, editorial opponents that he faced in the city. But what got overlooked, if you carefully read Prentice's editorials in the weeks leading up to Bloody Monday, he made certain that his problem was not with the Catholic faith, but rather with the Vatican and the Jesuits. 
And he urged that Catholic freedoms, freedom of religion, be protected. As a matter of fact, he espoused religious freedom for all Americans, including, to quote him, Muslims, Jews, and even pagans. In July, there were several editorial statements in which he shared his concern about the possibility of violence at the polls. And again, Election Day in America, beginning in the 1830s, the Jacksonian era, was, you know, the era of brass knuckle politics. Both parties, the Whigs and Democrats, would go to the saloons, go to the wharfs, the riverfront, hire the toughest jailbirds that they could find, and their job was to stand at the polling places and they would ask you, you know, uh, who are you voting for today, uh, uh, Mr. Jackson or Mr. Clay? And if you gave the wrong answer, you know, you got clipped with a club or punched in the nose with some brass knuckles. So given this typical election day environment, Prentice was very much concerned. He stated that anybody that engaged in violence should be hanged on the spot. He suggested that both parties form uh, guards at the polling places to prevent violence. He urged the city governments open up more polling places so there would be overcrowding. And he urged uh, Mayor John Barbie, who was a know nothing, as practically all the city officials were at that time, to beef up the police force. The most infamous thing he wrote was what was called in those days a squib. It wasn't a banner headline. And I'm paraphrasing here, but it was on the day before the election, Americans, are you ready? Then fire away, and may heaven uh, have mercy on the foe. Again, the rival Democratic newspapers were virtually printing the same thing to uh, their electorate at this time. This was a two or three sentence on page three of the election day issue, but it's always been portrayed as a banner headline and nothing was further from the truth. So what happened on this very tragic day, and it was a, a very tragic, one of the most tragic days in the history of Louisville. Well, late in the day, not from the opening of the polls, but late in the day when the polls were about to close, violence began to erupt. And what triggered the violence based on everything I could find was that three know-nothings were leaving their jobs on the war. And you could tell who was voting for who because the know-nothings would have like a yellow ticket in the hat band or in their pockets for the shirt. And that identified them as a, as a member of the Native American party. Well, three individuals were walking down in front of Quinn's Row, which was a, an Irish neighborhood. Uh, I think near 11th and Jefferson. And an Irish tough from New Orleans stepped out of the doorway and shot and killed one of these individuals. And then as that dead man's friend bent over to assist him, the Irishman shot him in the back of the head and killed him. Now, it's late in the election day. Most of the voters have been drinking, I'm sure, since they first got out of bed that morning, that morning. Emotions are running high. What's, what's gonna sweep through the cities from uh, one nativist to another? That some uh, Irish tub killed a couple of Americans? No, the Irish are killing Americans. So the local militia was called out and men went home to get their weapons and they surrounded Quinn's Row and threatened it with cannon fire. But cooler heads prevailed as far as the artillery, but soon shots began to be exchanged between people inside Quinn's Row and nativists on the street. And there were casualties on both sides. So Quinn's Row was put to the torch and a lot of innocent men and women that did not support the violence did not fire a shot, lost their lives in Quinn's Road and elsewhere in the city. In the aftermath of the riots, both parties blamed each other. 
But in time, when Prentice later uh, renounced his connections with the Native American Party and the Native American Party ceased to exist, it would be the Democratic Party narrative that would, would prevail in Louisville and would end up in the history books. So this tragedy, as terrible as it was, in my opinion anyway, and bear in mind, uh, I'm keeping an open mind and I plan to research this further, was a tragedy that involved you know, violence by initially small groups of people on both sides. And then it erupted and was completely out of control. Again, because law enforcement in those days were so primitive. And again, they had to rely on a, a company or two of militia to try to restore order. And they weren't able to succeed in that. So that's an overview of Prentice's life and times. Uh, the overview of America's first experience with mass immigration. And an overview of what this nation continues to experience with each new wave of immigrants, a clash of cultures that eventually, now that we are a melting pot, and now that we are more so a nation of immigrants, is fusing together uh, a lot less uh, violently than we've experienced in the past. Thanks for having me and I'll be happy to answer any questions. If for some reason we had uh, any kind of technical difficulties, uh, I joke with our tech people here that all I have to do is touch a keyboard and something will go wrong with uh, my laptop or their computer. Uh, you can feel free to email me, uh, James M, as in Michael Pritchard, P-R-I-C-H-A-R-D at gmail.com. I'd be happy to uh, assist you with any research if you have Bloody Monday connections on your side or answer any questions you might have today. Thanks very much for having me here. Well, thank you, Jim. It was excellent. Uh, I, I've i learned a lot about uh, Bloody Monday and, and the dynamics building up to that. Uh, very, very interesting. So I'm gonna open it up and uh, see if anybody else, we haven't had any questions posted so far. Um, Nancy, Nancy, I, I should add that one thing I wanted to emphasize Yes. I failed to say up front is that today I'm playing devil's advocate and looking at this from the uh, Native American side. And so I'm not only wearing the horns, but I've got the cloven hoofs and the pork tail as well. So uh, again, uh, I'm sort of just trying to put myself in, into their shoes and see, explain their viewpoint to all of us here today. Excellent. And I think that's probably our biggest fault in analyzing history is not knowing the back story. Um, what led, you know, what built to get to this point? And uh, I think we all fail it. We see this it. all over the country at this time in our history because I've noticed that more and more uh, historians uh, don't try to explain the past and help us understand the past. Uh, they like to uh, pass judgment on the past and condemn people for not looking at the world the way we do in the 21st century. And uh, as H.W. Brown said in a Filson presentation, he said, if you would time travel back to uh, the United States in the 1850s, an era of Henry Clay, you can understand the language. You would think that the fashions are quaint, but he said you would encounter people whose thinking and worldview you wouldn't be able to understand. You know, why, you know, why do they have this practice of dueling though? Uh, why is slavery considered, you know, a normal part of the South's uh, economy and society? You know, that's the thing that we have to uh, come to terms with when we, we study the past. Excellent, yes. I do have a question. Um, this Know Nothing Party, was the violence at that time regional or was it pretty well spread across the United States? How far did that extend from beyond Kentucky? Oh, the uh, uh, Native American movement? 
Yes. It was it was national and it was very strong, uh, stronger in the north uh, than really in the south. Uh, Southerners were more you know tolerant of the Catholic faith than uh, New Englanders, New Yorkers, Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, and uh, so it, it was a very it was a very strong political movement. And again, in 1856, they, you know, Millard Fillmore, uh, of course, uh, didn't end up on Mount Rushmore, you know, but <laughs> they were able to get a, a former president and a lot of really major political heavyweights, like, again, John J. Crittenden, Senator Crittenden of Kentucky, yes. to uh, support the party. Uh, let's see, we have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, what was Prentice's, what was the rest of his life like and how long did he live? What Actually, would be you know, it's, it's really kind of interesting because he, uh, his main claim to fame was, of course, not his connection uh, with the Know Nothing movement, but his uh, support of the Union uh, during the Civil War. And some historians have given him the credit for largely uh, preventing Kentucky from leaving the Union in 1861. Mm. But he was a man that outlived his times. Uh, his alcoholism uh, was so severe by the end of the war. And of course, by that time, he had only two sons. Both of them joined the Confederate Army. And one had been killed uh, riding with John Hunt Morgan's Raiders in 1862. And this completely broke the man. And so if you look at final photographs and portraits of him. He looks just exactly like King Lear. He's got wild hair to his shoulder and a full beard. And uh, he died of pneumonia in 1870, uh, two years after the merger of the old Louisville Daily Journal with the old Louisville Daily Courier. And uh, of course, today we have the Courier Journal. So his life towards the end was very tragic. Mm. Interesting. Let's see, another really good question was, um, and this is an opinion, what do you think uh, about the Princess statue? Should it have been removed? What should happen to it? What are your feelings? And again, this, this is my personal opinion. Uh -huh. um, the, Filson, right. the Filson, of course, uh, has offered sources to both people advocating the removal or keeping in place not only of the Prentice statue, but Castleman statue and others that have been controversial in our community. Personally speaking, I think it should have been kept in place. And the reason why, uh, I'm gonna steal a, a page from uh, Dr. David Blight's book, literally. Uh, he's a member of the Yale faculty who wrote the book on uh, Civil War memory that really has prompted all the controversy about Confederate statues. He gave a talk at the speed uh, two years ago that I attended, he says, what we have to ask is, look at the sum totality of the person's life. And for instance, in Prentice's place, did Bloody Monday overshadow his, everything else in his legacy? And I would say no. You know, the statue was originally dedicated and placed over the Courier Journal, which is kind of ironic to me, given Joe Gerth's tongue in cheek comments. Uh, it was over the entrance of the Courier Journal building downtown, placed there in the 1870s, and it, he was honored as a journalist. So that's another thing that Dr. Blight pointed out. Why, who was this person? What was their primary legacy? Why was the statue put in place? Well, he was honored as a, as a journalist. And of course, it eventually ended up in front of, or excuse me, at the rear of the library uh, in the early 20th century and was rededicated. So I think, though, it should have uh, been kept with more uh, context being added to, you know, again, his uh, role in Bloody Monday uh, and, uh, you know, what, what was different about those times and then the anti-immigrant uh, uh, fervor that we're witnessing today, which, of course, I naturally I don't support. Uh, as a matter of fact, if... Uh, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. I have, uh, you know, I was again raised a Methodist. I've been the, uh, one of those secular humanist characters uh, 
for most of my life. But I have many good uh, Roman Catholic uh, friends from high school in my hometown of Dayton, Ohio. And uh, on Facebook, uh, I, you know, they support Mr. Trump and I don't. Uh, some of them uh, say some uh, very derogatory things about Muslim immigrants. And I point out to them, I said, don't you realize that what you're saying about those immigrants, uh, my grandfather and my great-great-grandfather were saying about Catholic immigrants in this country. I said, you know, give them a chance. You know, uh, the, the, the Vatican didn't take over the American government. It's people literally feared in the 1850s. So give these new Americans a chance to see how, what kind of contributions they make to our society. So that to me would be another learning tool about keeping the statue in its place. Uh, <laughs> you know, Mel Brooks probably uh, did a better job of it, but you know, he, he sort of pointed out the, uh, the American panorama in Blazing Saddles, <laughs> where somebody is pointing a finger at some other group at one time or another during that film. And of course, that's the, the tragedy uh, in the American experience, but that sometimes it can uh, uh, appoint, approach the point of just being insanely ridiculous. You know, we're always pointing the finger, the yellow peril, uh, you know, the Italian threat and all this kind of thing. So it's part of the American tapestry, unfortunately. Well, uh, another question that came in, speaking of the American tapestry, and the polarization of politics, not only now, but if you know your history, as has existed for years in the political arena, a person has asked, do you worry about something similar happening in today's environment, especially after the next presidential election? So- uh, Into my own pers personal viewpoints. I think that there's, uh, I remember the 60s well, uh, 68, I was a high school student, so I, I was too young to participate in a lot of the uh, unrest on campus, but these times are more disturbing and frightening to me than anything that I've ever lived through. And uh, the language, you know, being used uh, by the extremes, I'm sort of a center left kind of person, by the extreme fringes, uh, you know, is, is really worrisome. And I could see something like this happening. Uh, Rich, Richard Hofstetter, the, the noted American scholar, wrote uh, a seminal work in the late 50s or early 60s, and I think it was entitled The Paranoid Style in American Politics. And unfortunately, there's an element in our politics where we we will uh, find some type of other, you know, and, and uh, stoke up fear about this particular group or that particular faith. And uh, I think that there, in the, today's climate in particular, uh, there is a chance that there might be some type of uh, uh, nationalist nativist party emerging uh, at some point. But, uh, you know, I hope the, the grand old party and the uh, Democratic Party continue to dominate the field. But, you know, again, there may be a third party fringe group that's, uh, that's will raise the old uh, know nothing and clan battle cry, America for Americans. Mm -hmm. And that's, that cry has been around for uh, well over a century now. Very good. Um, Right now, we don't have any other questions coming in, Jim, and uh, I just want to say thank you very much. Your presentation was excellent. We all need to engage into more discussions like this and listen to more people who have the historical facts to give us to put our present-day history in perspective. So thank you very much. Uh, like we talked delight. earlier, I'm hoping we get you back again. I'd love to hear a presentation on Mr. Clay. Um, so again, thank you the, very much. I, I really appreciate the invitation and look forward to working with you all and seeing you all in the future. Take care. Thank, 
Thank you. And thank you for all our attendees. Don't forget to uh, go visit our website at KYLGS and register for our fall, our fall seminar. And we thank all of you for attending today. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.